So today we are going to be talking about who are you? Um, I found some very interesting statistics for the last, what, two and a half years of this, this time we call the pandemic or COVID time. Um, it was interesting to me to look at uh, some of the statistics. So I was floored to find out that at the peak of COVID, the United States permanently lost 47% of its workforce. People retired early or permanently left their jobs. 47%. I'm like, well, no wonder everybody's hiring or no wonder they can't get enough people to have places open. It was amazing for me to see. And then I began to look at some of the other statistics that people were leaving jobs for a variety of reasons and switching to different jobs. People who left because they didn't feel safe, people who left because they were working a job they didn't feel appreciated at and they knew that they could get another job, usually for more money. But then a strange thing has been occurring. Over the last eight months, all of those people, not all of them, a good, a good number of those people who, who retired are re-entering the workforce. In fact, they're re-entering the workforce at a percentage that is about three times higher than it was pre-COVID. So for a variety of reasons, people are coming back. The biggest reason is <laughs> they underestimated how much it would cost to live on a fixed income, and this increase in prices that we're having has forced them to go back to work. Another reason that people have gone back to work is because they were bored. I think, I'm not 100% sure, but I think that would apply to some people in my house if they retired early. I don't want to mention any names, but I think she'd have to go back to work. Wait, she has gone back to work. So this whole idea of this huge exodus from the job created this huge group of people who began to ask themselves the question, who are you? Who am I? They would say to themselves, looking in the mirror. Who am I? What is it that I want to do? If I'm retired, what is it I'm going to do with my time? So I have parents as a point of reference uh, who are retired. And um, my father retired before my mother. And uh, my mother was annoyed with my father after he retired because she expected him to be doing things for her and he got busy doing other things for him. And he said, I don't have time to do your mom's list. I'm too busy. <laughs> and she did not understand that until she retired and she began to get involved in different things. And now... I have to schedule when I can see them. Like if I go and visit them in Florida, I have to say, what is a good day to be there? What are good days for me to visit you? Because they have the things that they do during the week, whether it be uh, sporting activities or social events or all the different things that they do, they're busy. But I think during the pandemic, with being isolated, kind of separated from one another, there were a whole group of people who retired who didn't have those things that they could get involved in. 
They couldn't get together with those people who were of like minds, those people who had also retired early. They weren't able to get together. And so there were people who were just sitting around with nothing to do and asking themselves the question, who am I? So I thought about what I could use as an example for a story for kind of being confused with that question. I know there are some of you out there who have always known what you wanted to be. And I think that's wonderful. I think it's marvelous that you know what it is that you want to be or do or become. I think that is great. But for some of us, it was a difficult question to answer. When I graduated uh, from high school, I remember sitting down with that counselor in the office, and the counselor said to me, what is it that you want to do? And I didn't really have an idea. I said, I think I want to work in the medical field. And he, and he said to me, yes, your grades in math and science are good. You'll be able to do that. You should really think about exactly what it is that you want to do so that you can get into a school that has a good college of whatever it is you decide to do. And he said, if you want to become a medical doctor, and I was like, no, no, I do not want to become a medical doctor. And so I settled upon nursing. So I applied for and was accepted at Wayne State University and applied for and was accepted into the nursing program at Wayne State University. And I began to take pre-nursing classes, began to go to college to do that. And eventually you get to that point where you go to one of your very first nursing classes. And about three weeks into that class, I realized I cannot be a nurse. Now, later in my life, I learned that maybe I could have been a nurse because I've been forced into some situations that are similar to nursing situations. But the reality is, at the time, I didn't think I could do it. And I think I was right about that. I would not have been happy being a nurse. Now, some of you are sitting there and going, wait a minute, wait a minute, happy at work? What are you talking about? Right? But the reality is, that was my mindset. I wanted to be happy doing the job that I was doing. It is amazing Gen X and Gen Z people are more concerned about their mental well-being and the jobs that they have than they are concerned about how much money they make. I see that in my kids. I see that in Emma. I see that in David. I hear that in Brittany as she struggles to figure out what it is that she wants to do. And I try and tell all of my kids... You're not married to any one job. As I began to get into the workforce, I did many different things. I started off thinking that I was going to be in that medical field. I finally got my degree in psychology, which has been absolutely useless other than a piece of paper to say that I've graduated from college. But I worked in customer service. I worked in a warehouse. I did all kinds of things. I kept searching for what it was that I wanted to do. And every once in a while, I would look in the mirror and I would say, who am I? How do I see myself being? And so when I worked in that warehouse, it was good physical, manual labor. It was honest, quote-unquote, honest work. And I thought, maybe I can do this for the rest of my life, and I will, in my free time, do the thing that I love to do. But the further I got down that road, I realized that 
Doing that job left me very little free time, especially if I was going to have a family and kids. And so I went to work at a Fortune 500 company in customer service. What better place to be? Until I learned about downsizing. In the company that I worked for, there was no seniority. If you got downsized, you found out the day that you lost your job. They would show up at your desk with a box, and they would say, put all of your personal belongings into this box. This security guard is going to stay with you while you do that. He is going to make sure that you don't take anything from this building that isn't yours, and here's your severance check. Have a good life. And I thought, that is no way to live. And so Marla and I were both working we were planning on starting a family, and as she was pregnant for, with David, our first uh, child, a decision had to be made. Who was going to stay home and who was going to work? And as we talked about job security, it was very obvious that her job was much more secure than my job, and so I should stay at home and be a full-time dad. I'm here to tell you I was the second worst full-time dad ever in the history of the world. There had to have been somebody worse than me. I don't I haven't met him yet, but I think I'm going to meet him one time in my life, and we're going to have conversations. I did it for five years, and I was bad at it for five years. I thought I would improve, but I did not. I did not improve. My children are still alive, so I must have been passable. But there are a couple of moments there, just barely. And all throughout that time, I did work in the church. I worked at camps. I worked with youth groups. Uh, I, I was on all of the committees that, that you dread being on. Uh, I was on trustees. I was on PPR. I was on membership. I did all of those things, and I had a blast doing that stuff. I remember the first time they asked me to go to annual conference. For those of you who have been to annual conference, you know it's a wonderful experience, but you know that the work of the church is not the most exciting work that there is to be doing. In the middle of legislation, it gets very boring. I enjoyed it. God was whispering in my ear all along, reminding me who I was, calling me to full-time ministry. I believe that God whispers to each of us, and I don't care if we're three or 103. I think God whispers to each of us what it is that God has called us to do. And so when you find yourself at a transition in life and you see yourself looking in the mirror and you say, who am I and what am I going to do? I think God already has a plan for us. God had a plan for me all of those years ago. As I sat in that counselor's office when I was 17 years old, deciding what college I would go to, I think God knew the plan all the way through. God knew the experience that I needed. God put me in the path with the right people, in the right places, at the right time. And when I began ministry in 2001... I was hired on a wing and a prayer. I was a warm body for a little church in the middle of nowhere. The district superintendent, I think the most important thing for him was, do you have a criminal record? I want to make sure I wasn't a felon. But other than that, he was ready to put me in that church. He didn't know me from Adam. I'd put my application out to district's all over Michigan and Ohio to be hired. And the one call that I got from Ohio was the very first call, and it was here, what is now Northwest Plains, which at the time 
I believe might have been the Finley district. I'm not exactly sure. The names have changed. And he put me to work. And I went on that first Sunday, and he called me, I don't know, it was five or six weeks into the process of being a minister, and he said, how are you doing? Just calling to see if you're going to stay in ministry. He goes, it's a call that I make to all new people. And I said, it's great. It's wonderful. It fits. I describe it as putting on my favorite pair of slippers. If you are a slipper wearer and you have a favorite pair of slippers to wear around the house, you know how it is when those slippers begin to wear out and you know that you're going to have to get a new pair of slippers. You don't want to. Maybe your spouse forces you to because your slippers look so ugly. But they're worn in and they're perfect and they fit your feet and they're comfortable and you don't want to give them up. That's the way ministry was for me. And I believe God calls each of us to that place where we can feel comfortable and at home. So when you ask the question, who am I? Or what is it that I'm supposed to be doing with my life, God? I think God already has the answer. It's our responsibility to find the answer. It took me 13 years to find the answer. 13 years, I wandered around. I, uh, I equate it to uh, the Israelites wandering in the desert. I wandered around, and I did different things, and I knew I wasn't happy. Even with my own children, who I love immensely, I wasn't truly happy. But as soon as I did that thing that I believe God has called me to do, there was a comfort and a peace about it. So as you are struggling with the question, who am I? I think... I know that you need to be asking God, what is it that you want me to do, God? Where is it that you want me to be in ministry? You see, because each of us, you and I, we each have a ministry. Now, your ministry might be greeting people at the back of the church and being hospitable. Your ministry might be (laughs) tearing apart a ramp early in the morning. And for the, for the two people who tore apart the ramp that we were supposed to tear apart on Thursday, good job, you guys. But I am still not getting up that early to tear apart a ramp. Because I don't think I'm called to it. Afternoon, sure, I'll be there. And I joked around a lot. But the reality is, I think they had fun. They enjoyed themselves. They felt called to do it. Whatever it is, wherever it is that you're called to be and do, I want you to listen for God speaking in your life. Our scripture today talked about how God has and wants us to be fulfilled and happy. God has a plan to prosper us. And I believe when you are doing the thing that it is that God has called you to do, even if you don't have money, I think people around you see you prospering. You're happy. There's a joy in your life. I have a daughter who dances. You can't make a living doing that. Everybody knows it. Well, you can, but you have to be exceptional. But yet, what is she? A professional dancer. She's happy. Yes, she works another job so that she can do the thing that makes her happy, that God has called her to do. 
at the age of three, music would play and she would dance. It's been in her all that time. It's amazing to see it when it peeks out and I see God's purpose in her life. I have an older son who helps people. As since he was this tall, <laughs> Marla was pregnant in August, and she would lay down on the couch after work to take a nap in our house without air conditioning, and my son would cover her up with an afghan. <laughs> my three-year-old son would cover her with an afghan in July on the couch. And she would say, stop covering me. And he said, oh, it's okay, mommy. You'll feel better. He's a 911 dispatcher. He enjoys doing other things. But his call is to help. I have two teenagers. And they're figuring out what their call is. And I think they will figure it out if they listen to what God is calling them to do. And I think they each will find it in their life if they'll continue to ask God for the help. And so will you. So if you're 78 years old and you don't know what it is that you want to do, ask God. If you're 23 years old, and you're not sure what it is that you want to do, ask God. If you have a grandson or a granddaughter who is struggling with that issue, pray for them. Pray specifically that God would lead them in a way that is pleasing to God and will make them happy because God's plan is to prosper us all. So when you find yourself in the midst of transition, like so many have found us, so many of us have found ourselves in the midst of COVID, in the midst of a transition and not knowing to do what, not knowing what we will do with our lives, listen to what God is calling you to do. Because when you ask the question, who am I? God already knows the answer and knows what will make your life complete and fit you like those comfortable slippers that you can't throw away because they're your favorites. God knows where that is in your life. Of that, I am sure. Will you pray with me? God of grace and mercy, we give thanks that you know all things. Lord, in the midst of trials and tribulations, you have a plan. Help us to trust you. In the midst of joy and happiness, you have a plan. Help us to trust you. Wherever we find ourselves in life, we know that you have a plan for us. Help us to seek you and to seek your plan for our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.
Go forth from this place in the sure knowledge that God loves you.